Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth interactive study of the Word of God. I'm glad you joined us today as we continue a fascinating series of studies on discipleship, learning lessons from Jesus, the way he interacted with people, and lessons for our lives today. Our topic today with the rich and the famous, and I'm glad you joined us. I want to welcome our Hope Sabbath School team here in the studio. Good to be together again, isn't it? Yeah. What a great series of lessons, Amen. learning so much from Jesus. And we're just so glad that you're a part of this series too, because as we get emails from you from around the world, we can tell that God is blessing your life and through you blessing the lives of those around you. Here are just a few emails that have been sent to our address at sshope at hopetv.org. And even if you've written to us before, we're always excited to hear from you. In fact, we send your emails not only to our participants team but to the media team as well because we're all encouraged to hear how God is blessing your life. Here's a note from Tony and Gudrun in Australia and uh, they say they live in a little country town a hundred kilometers from Adelaide. You've heard of Adelaide? Mm -hmm. Talem Bend. Never heard of it. <laughs> Even though the broadcast is late on Friday we really enjoy the interactivity of Hope Sabbath School. And the theme songs are so uplifting. We travel about 50 minutes one way to church. Mm -hmm. So we don't make it to the Sabbath school. But being part of Hope Sabbath School is so encouraging. God bless each one of you. Well, Tony and Gudrun, thanks for writing from Australia. They are about 100 kilometers outside of Adelaide. We're glad you're part of our Hope Sabbath School family. Neil writes from the same part of the world, close anyway, New Zealand. And Neil says, I was just baptized, praise the Lord. Amen. Wow, that's a confession that you're a follower of Jesus. Right. And he says, on most mornings, I watch Hope Sabbath School on the internet. Mm -hmm. So he goes to hopetv.org slash hopess. That's our web address. And we've got about 130 countries we know of that take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And he says, how blessed I am to have such beautiful people sharing the word of God with me. <laughs> With a hunger to learn more and more, I find the Hope Sabbath School so uplifting. God bless you all and be with you always. Love, Neil. Well, Neil, thanks for writing from New Zealand. And we're so excited that you've decided to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Confess that in baptism. I know God's going to use you to bless those around you. Marital writes from North Carolina. Thanks for writing to us. And I uh, actually gave Marital a call because I didn't know whether Marital was a man or a lady mm -hmm. because it's a very unique name. And, and uh, hello, Mar Marital here. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad that this brother is part of our Hope Sabbath School. He said, I enjoy Hope Sabbath School on the Hope Channel. I use your study guide in facilitating my own class. Amen. So Marital, you're a teacher. And by the way, you can download the outline from our website hopetv.org slash hope ss you can have the same outline that we use in our study he says I use that and I like what he said next he said at 72 years of age I don't try to reinvent the wheel <laughs> so you've got a great outline just download it I don't try to reinvent the wheel when resources like yours are available this guide is a great help in getting everyone involved in the discussion well Marital thanks for writing to us from North Carolina in the United States. And we have many teachers who watch Hope Sabbath School. And think about that. We, we, they estimate a million people watching Hope Sabbath School, but imagine all the people that get taught mm. the Word of God beyond that circle. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. So exciting. And here's one last email from Tembo. Tembo, that's not Australia. <laughs> Tembo is from Zambia. Tembo writes and says, I'm a constant viewer of Hope Sabbath School every week. The interactive discussions really enrich my Christian life. Amen. It's awesome. Every week I listen to the discussion and I grow in spiritual realms. I'm a fourth year student at the University of Zambia pursuing a degree in education. I've come to understand that besides, listen to this, this is powerful, that besides academic knowledge gained in school, one should also possess that knowledge which, co which comes from God Amen. through listening Amen. to programs like Hope Sabbath School. Amen. 
Well, pray for me, he said, as I come to the end of my studies, and I always remember you in my prayers. Tembo, thanks for writing to us from Zambia, and you are so correct. We believe in education, but in addition to academic training, we need that wisdom that comes from God. Yes. And we're glad that you're part of our Hope Sabbath School. And if you've not written to us, wherever you live around the world, write to us at sshope at hopetv.org. You can also go to our website, hopetv.org slash hopess. You can download the theme song for this series of studies on discipleship. You can get the sheet music. You can get the audio file. You can learn the song and sing it with us wherever you are around the world. We're going to sing it right now. It's taken from Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 through 30, and it's called Come to Me. exciting to share with our viewers around the world. We have a teacher today from our class. I'm always excited when part of our Hope Sabbath School team stands up and says, by the grace of God and the blessing of the Spirit, I'm going to share the Word of God today. And Nathan, we are really excited that you're going to teach today an important topic on with the rich and famous, and uh, perhaps you could lead us in prayer as we begin our study. Okay, thank you. Let's pray, please. Father in heaven, we are blessed to be a part of this study together today. And as we open your word, we want to remember that you inspired the words we're about to read and study. Your Holy Spirit, who inspired the prophets to write them, is with us even now to help us understand. But not just here with us, but with our viewers all around the world and our listeners. And we ask that you would bless them too through this study. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. 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 Well, we're glad to be studying today with you. And I want to, first of all, before we begin, I want to start right out front with a very soul-searching, honest question. Because today we're talking about you, the rich and famous. 
Meh. How many of you say, yeah, that's me? <laughs> no, okay, not really, not quite. Yeah. But how many of you have ever desired to be rich, famous, or powerful and influential? You don't have to raise your hands if you don't want to, but if you're honest, maybe every hand would go up, right? You yep. wish. Now, here's a real tough question for you, a little probing a little deeper. How many of you have ever asked God for that? You've prayed about it. Lord, I want to be richer. Maybe you didn't say it that way, but I want you to bless me financially. Or you wished you had more opportunity or power or influence. If we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we're wishing that we were in somebody else's shoes, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so today we're going to look at some of those individuals recorded in Scripture, four of them. Anybody know from previewing the lesson, who are we going to look at today? The lives and experiences of first Nicodemus, Nicodemus. right? Mm -hmm. And then... Young, Before the rich young ruler, we're going to look at Matthew, a tax collector who was, had a very uh, cushy, powerful position and a good income in his job. And then we're going to look at the rich, rich young ruler and the rich fool. So we'll look at those par that parable from Jesus. So let's start by turning to Nicodemus's story in John chapter 9. I'm sorry, John chapter 3. And we'll look at the experience that we had, Jesus had with Nicodemus. And I wonder, Missy, would you be willing to read verses 1 and 2 for us? I am John reading, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. I'm reading from the New King James Version. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a, lead, a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. All right, thank you. Who do you think arranged for this meeting? Who requested this meeting? Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Nicodemus right? Mm -hmm. And why do you think he came under cover of darkness? Well, maybe before we answer that question, we could ask, why did he want to meet Jesus at all? What do you think? Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, probably a member of the Sanhedrin Council. Very powerful position, influential, and he was wealthy. Why would he want to meet Jesus? Yeah. Ulrich, what do you think? Um, he mentioned here in, in um, verse 2 that um, no one can do these things unless God is with him. So uh, even though Nicodemus was part of um, the Pharisees, um, the, the religious establishment who um, were somewhat opposed to Jesus, uh, apparently he had uh, some conviction uh, based on what he heard Jesus was teaching and the things that he mm -hmm. was doing. Okay. And, but instead of meeting him during the daytime where his fellow uh, leaders would see him and ridicule him, he chose to meet Jesus at night. To okay, we'll talk about him. how he came at night. But first of all, we understand that he wanted to come to Jesus because he believed Jesus was a teacher from God. From God. From God. From God. Yeah. And who was he among the ruling council? They were... The religious Teachers. leaders. Teachers. Right. Yeah. Leaders. So sent from God in some <laughs> regard because they were the ones that were teaching That's God's right. teachings mm -hmm. to the people. They kind of saw themselves in that position. We're God's teachers for his people. Mm -hmm. Now they hear Jesus teaching. Nicodemus says, there's something about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you think that Nicodemus is thinking this guy in his powerful method of teaching mm -hmm. could possibly be a colleague of ours? Maybe he, even though he yeah. didn't come through our system. Yeah. He's a potential colleague, so he wants to interview him, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. get to know him, yes. yeah. see how the relationship might work between him and the council. But he comes in the cover of darkness. Mm -hmm. Ulrich, you kind of referred to that. Why did he come? Anyone else have any thoughts? Why was it important for him to come at night, Jennifer? So I think he thought that maybe there was something there, but he needed more information. So mm -hmm. instead of taking on all this risk, meeting Jesus by day, he was like, you know, there's something about this man. I need to find out more. Let me do this within my comfort zone. And he, he right. was, okay, within his comfort zone because he wasn't sure. Yeah. Willie and then Marianella. I think uh, it's because, uh, first of all, he knew Jesus was not a part of the ruling, bo ruling body, uh, the, the mm -hmm. Sanhedrin, and he was not an ordained pastor, if you will. Uh, he was uh, considered rabbi of his followers, but he was not actually a part of their... Wasn't uh, approved by the religious right, establishment. So, yes. And he was also looking out for his reputation as a uh, uh, ruler of the Jews. So okay, maybe. so if he's seen with him, he would already be considered as right. a possible... Exactly. Uh, the connection there was a colleague. And, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mary Nella? Yeah, I was going to add to that. His position could be at risk, too. Mm -hmm. He could lose All right. privileges. He's hobnobbing with somebody yeah. that may be of questionable character, right. character right. because the establishment has not yet approved him as a teacher, and he's mm. being cautious and, about that. Derek? You know, I like what Jennifer said. I, I, I think I grew up thinking, bad fellow, unashamed unash yeah. to come during the daytime. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that Nicodemus, he certainly, his heart was open. Mm -hmm. and he came. He came. And, and I think he's saying, you know, I have a lot of influence. And before I just walk right into this, it, it, this man seems to be sent from God. Mm -hmm. but, but I think it's responsible that I have a conversation with him sure. before thousands of people go, well, Nicodemus went. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, especially as I see how courageous he is later in the story, mm -hmm. to say, you know, if we're influential people, we need to be careful about our example. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Once he's sure, then, mm -hmm. then, then there's a boldness there. So I think I've changed my attitude from when I was little, right. mm -hmm. when I thought he was just kind of a, a bit cowardly. Right, right. And he just came at night time. Maybe that's why we always keep studying God's Word, because there might be deeper insights we don't always yeah. know from the beginning when we first read. All right, so Nicodemus, in his interview with Jesus, says, we know that you're a teacher sent from God, because no one could do these signs, right, right? Mm -hmm. that you do unless God were with him. So what were the signs that he had done? What was Nicodemus referring to? He had turned um, water into wine. Water into wine. Yeah. We noticed that in John 2, okay? John 2 previously. That was the beginning of signs, John said, in mm -hmm. his ministry. Mm -hmm. What else was done? Take a look at John chapter 2. Maybe we can read something. We won't take the time to read John 2 1 through 11, that's the story of what happened there at the wedding feast. Uh, but this is how John sets up before he introduces Nicodemus to us. He tells us some of the things that Jesus had done, and then Nicodemus refers to signs. So we're going to see what some of those signs were. Uh, would someone be willing to read for us verses 13 through 17 in John chapter 2? 13 through 17. Abigail, you got that? Thank you. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves of sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some robes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers, coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then, going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. I like that. That version was the New, New Living, Living Translation. Translation. Passion for God's house, your Bible may say, zeal for God's house has consumed me or filled me up. So this is a picture of Jesus that we don't often think about. When you think of Jesus, I think most of us probably think of him as calm, gentle, kind, mm -hmm. loving, which he was, all of that. Yeah. But here we see this picture, and I'm glad John records it for us. We see a picture of Jesus with authority yeah. in God's house. Mm -hmm. And he takes charge, drives out those that are doing unseemly things, mm -hmm. uh, inappropriate things in God's house, because it's inhibiting the worship experience of what God wanted his people to have there. Okay, so you see this picture. That is a sign, perhaps, that sure. Nicodemus was referring to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did Jesus have any recognized authority as he came into the temple? To, to do that. Was he an authority in the temple? Did the no. temple leader see him as somebody who could take charge? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think it was because he didn't have recognized authority, and yet he came with this holy boldness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this person who was from this very common family without a lot of wealth, without a lot of formal education in their system, to speak with such authority and then have everyone in the temple listen to what he said. When Nicodemus saw that, maybe he was thinking, man, this guy's got some influence and power that we, the religious establishment, okay. don't even have. Good point. Mm -hmm. Missy? I believe divinity flashed through him, and the people recognized God in him mm -hmm. as God himself. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, why else would they leave with their tails tucked between their legs? Yeah, this was, this was amazing. <laughs> Here comes this guy with no established credentials, and yet he has so much authority mm -hmm. in his 
in his command of the situation mm -hmm. that they recognized that authority and, and God was at work in him and they recognized the authority and they responded appropriately, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think back to earlier, even though they recognized that they were teaching about God, when, when Nicodemus says, you're a teacher come from God, mm -hmm. he, he's talking about that divine authority that yeah. he saw. And a prophecy was being fulfilled in their midst. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Malachi. What? Zeal for your house has consumed me. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And so he's actually coming to the temple, mm -hmm. which Malachi said would happen. Right. And that they wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to resist that. Mm -hmm. So God was at work right there in their midst, and they're just... Whew. Okay. So that was a sign that got Nicodemus' attention, right? Right. right? And the others as well. Okay. So let's take a look at somebody, if you would read verse 18 and then verse 23. This was verse 18. We'll look at first. This was how the Jews responded after they kind of caught their breath and got their wits about them. Marianella, would you read verse 18? Yes. John 2. John 2. John 2, verse 18. 18. I'm you. reading from the New International Version. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Okay, so mm. they were demanding a sign. Look, you come in here like you own the place, and they wanted a sign. Jesus said what? We won't take the time to read through that, but Jesus mm -hmm. said, I'm not going to give you a sign except for <laughs> Abigail. Destroy the temple and I will build it in three days. <laughs> yes, and they were like, what? 46 years this temple's been under construction. You're going to destroy it and build it up in three days. <clears throat> and the scripture tells us he was referring to the temple of his body. Okay, so that's one sign. And then, although they didn't fully understand that, of course, at the time. Who will read for us verse 23? John chapter 2, verse 23. Stephanie, you ready to read that? John chapter 2, verse 23 in the New... New King James Version. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Okay, so there at the Passover, mm -hmm. the signs which he did, we, there may have been others. We, we looked at a couple of things that happened there with the cleansing um, and his response to the Jews. And then before that, there was a smaller crowd around at the wedding, but the word spread about that. And so people are beginning to believe in him. All right, so this interview takes place. Those are the signs that he was referring to. And let's take a look at John 3, and let's just read verses 13 through 15. We read that. I'm sorry. Um, 3 through 15 is actually the story, yeah. Nathan, of, of Jesus interacting. How did, how did Jesus respond to Nicodemus? That's what was an important, yeah. important insight. So he comes by night, and Jesus entertains his questions or his mm -hmm. interview. So anyone want to respond to that? How did he? Willie? If you, if you notice, he didn't really um, exchange niceties with him. He just went straight forward to what he was going to say. And he okay, said, so uh, truly, let me truly pause for just a moment. You said something about exchanging niceties. The culture was that when you want to have some kind of interview with someone that you consider respectable and powerful, you begin with a little bit of flattery. Right. And so you see him doing that with Jesus. We know you're a teacher come from God, right? Sure. And the, the expected response in the culture would be that Jesus would also mm. throw back a little flattery. You know, we're working together here. It's part of their culture. And you said he didn't exchange niceties. He skipped the formal flatteries. That's right. And he went to what? He just said, truly, truly, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> the first words in your version are truly, truly truly. Mm -hmm. Your Bible may say most assuredly or most certainly, yeah. I tell you. So he's going from niceties, formalities into what? Where does he go? Yeah. Truly, truly means he's going to share truth, truth right? right? Mm -hmm. So he says, let's skip all that and let's get to the heart of the matter. I have truth to share with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he goes right straight to the point mm -hmm. of truth. Now, what did, what did that do for Nicodemus? What was the essence of what he shared, first of all? Uh, I think for the sake of time, we won't read through all of this. You know that he tells him a man must be what? Born, born, again. born, again. born again. Born of water and the Spirit. Born again in order to see the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus is saying, wait a minute. We're the teachers of God. We're here representing, teaching about God. And we know about how to get into the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, let me tell you the truth, mm -hmm. truly, truly, emphasizing that a man must be born again. Someone must be born again. 
What do you think Nicodemus thought of that? Because they did have this expectation when he mentions born of water and the spirit. The Jews would bring a convert who was a Gentile into their faith through what we would call baptism today. Mm -hmm. But not for a Jew to be needing this born again experience. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, we're already in the house of God, so to speak, among his family. Jennifer. So I think what was really special about the interaction between Nicodemus and Jesus is that you know, Nicodemus came at night. That was his comfort zone. Jesus said, I need a public declaration. You know, mm. you're going to have to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, which will change your heart. But then you also need to be baptized in water, which is a public statement to everyone that you're my follower. And so Jesus knew exactly, you know, what he needed to say to Nicodemus. So the essence of Jesus teaching to Nicodemus was, maybe we could sum it up by saying, not this, but that. Mm -hmm. What was the not this part of it? If you're going to say, Jesus was trying to tell him, truly, truly, I say to you, so even though it's not spelled out, he was telling Nicodemus, don't trust in what? In the flesh, Yourself. in your knowledge. Yourself. Your ethical knowledge. knowledge. It your was knowledge, training, your ritual. position, yeah. Yeah. your influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are the things that perhaps Nicodemus could have felt quite self-confident in. Mm -hmm. He was comfortable with his, where he was with God. And what did Jesus' teaching do here? It completely mm -hmm. upset that. It's like, wow, a whole new worldview now that he's presented with. Ulrich. Um, you, you just touched on something that, um, briefly. Uh, remember, Jesus had told them one time that you search the scriptures, thinking in it you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these are the scriptures that testify of me. So apparently they thought that the, the, the more they read the scriptures and, and know what's in the scriptures, through that they, they gain eternal life. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus here that, yes, you, you might be a teacher and part of the religious establishment, but your knowledge is not going to get you into the kingdom of God. Right. Mm. That's right. You need to be born again. So he again. challenged, the not this part of the message was not trusting in his status or position exactly. or influence. Exactly. All right. And then the not this but that part would be, it was, we mentioned, the spiritual rebirth is necessary. Right. Okay. Yeah. So for an influential person to, you skip the flatteries and you go right, he says, Jesus is telling him, there's something more important for you. Let's get right to the point. You need to know that a person needs to be born again to see the kingdom of God. That's yeah. right. Maybe we could keep that in mind as we, what if you ever have the opportunity to interact with an influential person who may trust their position or their status, even in a religious way, the, me the lesson for us is we should share what with them? The truth. 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 truth is, you know, all the formalities and, and the, the worldview that they might have been engendered with, and mm. no, and it, that's it, not going to save you. It's yeah. share truth. But Jesus does it gently, tactfully, mm -hmm. his interaction. Mm -hmm. And only by God's spirit can we do the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And he okay. explains it really well. He yeah, he, was, he, says, he explained it. Yeah, you think it could be, it's not the being born from the flesh. It's from the spirit. And he goes on to explain yeah. that. Through that which is so. born of the flesh mm -hmm. is yeah. flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. spirit. Yeah. Well, we should move on and take a look at our next character in our study here. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 9. And we're going to meet one of those who's called to follow Jesus. You ready to read, Daisy? Would you read for us? Sure. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9 and read verses 9 through 13. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax, tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people do not need a doctor. Sick people do. Mm. Then he added, Now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. Mm. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Wow, I would have loved to be there in the crowd to hear that interaction. Mm. <laughs> I like the way your version puts it. Uh, it mentions that he was eating with scum. Or why is he hanging around such scum? Ooh, strong. Mm. 
But that's really what they were thinking. thinking. Right. You're not supposed to fellowship. Why would they think that, by the way? Where did they get that idea from? They had seen those people and knew the kind of lifestyle they lived, and they knew that wasn't right. So why would Jesus, if he was holy or from God, want to associate himself with you know, people with bad reputation or people that even commoners wouldn't want to hang with? I think it was the norm of the day to characterize certain people in certain ways. Okay. All right. Was there any scriptural basis for this, perhaps, that they might have, I'm not saying it was a proper understanding, but where would they go to, for instance, think of the Psalms, right at the beginning, the very first Psalm, how does it start? Anybody know it from memory, or shall Blessed we turn to it? man that yeah. walks Ulrich? not, not in, in the counsel of the ungodly, mm -hmm. yeah. nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scorpion. So the man who's not walking in the path of the ungodly, nor standing in the way of sinners, nor sitting in the seat of the scornful, I think you're quoting from the King James Version, in other words... That man is blessed. Well, these are the people that that, script, that verse is talking about. And so they say, well, we have a scriptural basis for our views. Mm -hmm. We don't want to interact with such people. Mm -hmm. Now, God's talking about the blessings of not engaging in a lifestyle and immersing yourself in a lifestyle like that. Mm -hmm. But he's not saying we should avoid those people to reach out for them for him. Tyler. Mm -hmm. They did have a scriptural basis, but they had a misunderstanding of the character of God. Mm -hmm. He said, I did not come to call the righteous, but who? Sinners. So Jesus straightens repentance. out their understanding of God yes. through quoting scripture. And that well. was his whole point of sitting with them to make a public confession that I've come to call you to repentance. Okay, you're leading us to a question I wanted to ask. Why didn't Jesus say, I better meet this character under the cover of darkness? Because <laughs> <laughs> he calls him by daylight. Why would he do that, Ulrich? Um, I think Jesus here was trying to teach um, uh, the, the establishment uh, to break down that barrier of, of stereotyping and prejudice and uh, shunning and neglecting of people who they deem to be unfit for the kingdom. Right. A tax collector. A tax yeah. who was not, Now, he may have been collecting taxes, uh, farming for Rome, so to speak, yeah. turning them. But he also, because of his location, he may have been a tax collector who was charging uh, tolls or tariffs in, uh, in this trade route. Uh, there's either way, he was lining his pockets. He was doing a pretty good business for himself, mm -hmm. and he was not loved and respected by the people because of that. <laughs> and so they were kind of put in the class of those that you don't fellowship with, you don't associate with them. And Jesus calls him, you made the point, so that others would see. Hey. Is there anyone else that Jesus wanted to understand something through this, that it wasn't just the others that were supposed to understand something? Matthew and Oh, us, okay, yeah, us, yeah. but what about <laughs> Matthew himself? It was, Matthew. Matthew himself. Yeah. Yeah. it was what Matthew needed. Matthew I mean, needed to know this. Yeah, the, um, you know, Nicodemus needed something different than Matthew, and it just shows that Jesus cares about the individual. Oh, mm -hmm. So Nicodemus Amen. had to protect his reputation. Yeah. At that point, he right. was, you know, being cautious. Matthew needed to know that he was accepted exactly. and not an outcast in in Jesus' understanding. You know, right? I think sometimes, Nathan, we're, we're a bit intimidated by wealthy or famous people. Uh, and and, and we, we assume that they wouldn't be interested mm -hmm. in Jesus or the kingdom. Mm -hmm. but, but we've seen Nicodemus, mm -hmm. his heart was open. Uh, I think it's interesting. Matthew, of course, writes this gospel that tells the story. Uh, and he's quite humble. Luke records it too, and says, Matthew, it says, he left everything. He left all. He yes. left all. Uh, and and, and it, it also says that it went, they went to his house. This just says the house in mm -hmm. Matthew. Mm -hmm. So I, I think Matthew is very, can I say, humble in the way he records the story. Luke looks at the story and says, do you have any idea how earnest this man was? Right. Mm -hmm. Just waiting yeah. for the invitation. And of course, Luke, of in his telling of it, he calls him Levi. So right, right, we need yeah. to make that connection that this is Matthew he's talking about. Right. But yes, this is important because Jesus wants to, him to understand he's accepted. And what you shared here is important because we cannot assume that anyone, no matter what their position, their status in society, that they're not a candidate for the kingdom of God. Yeah. Right. 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 God's yeah. hearts is work, God is working on their heart. They're open and they'll be receptive. So we have Matthew here. Mm -hmm. leaving everything, a very good lifestyle, mm -hmm. because he saw something more attractive. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people today I, that will give up everything because they love Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's right. I had a friend in my early Christian experience, and I was walking in his front yard or driveway with him, and I told him, 
you have a beautiful place here. And he said to me, you may know this person. He said to me, I'd leave it in a minute for Jesus. Mm. Mm. Amen. Amen. That was you. <laughs> and, and it impressed my heart. I remember it, you know, 27 years later or whatever. I remember, uh, you know, I was a poor country boy, and you'd invited me, and I said, you have a nice house. It wasn't extravagant or anything. And you said, you know, whatever I have, I'd be happy to leave it in a moment Amen. for Jesus. Amen. Amen. He called Amen. me to do that. Amen. Amen. Hey, that's the way we ought to relate to our stuff, right? And we're yes. going right. to talk about that a little bit more. So thank you for yes. teaching me that lesson. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look then. Um, the way that Jesus related to, before we move on, ask yourself this question. How should we relate to those who are the disassociated? Mm -hmm. hmm. Daisy. I think we should try as much as, as possible not to just judge them right away. Because we have the tendency of doing that. Regardless of whether they're, you know, high class or low class. And it's very hard sometimes. We're either intimidated, feel like they're too good to associate with us, or they're not good enough for us to associate with them. So either way, just as Jesus set an example for us by not, you know, leaving them out, we're following in Jesus' footsteps. We are supposed to be welcoming to them. And you'll try to reach, don't prejudice them. Just Mm. at least try to share something with them first and if they cast you out at least you try but we have to first get beyond our own bias about That's people true. who we might not normally associate with joy and uh, and get beyond our desire to protect our own image yes mm. 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 Wow. what think, if people see me with this person mm. Mm. what do they think of me yeah mm. what did he uh, is there any lesson for us before i take some more hands whether we should reach out to people like the, of a disreputable character perhaps under cover of darkness or in the broad daylight? What do you think? What's the best time to do that, Missy? Broad daylight. Why? Well, you don't want to put out an image that may be false. Okay. I think it'd be best uh, so that everything is clear and out in the open and there's no questionable uh, scenario. That's that good on a number of levels because first of all it's you communicating to them openly I'm not ashamed to be seen with you you're, you're a child of God too and I'm willing to spend time openly with you but also because you're not doing under cover of darkness if people should see you they might have questions and we're supposed to avoid the appearance of evil as God's children right? That's right. You might want to just take that precaution let me embrace this individual in a dialogue out in the open. Yes. Willie I was just going to say, uh, in dealing with uh, people of uh, not so good reputation, we are also admonished that we we're, we're, should be praying always or we'll be uh, like one of them if we don't be careful. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but for the grace of God, go on. Mm. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, go learn what that means. And that was a common expression for rabbis. That, you know, go study this and figure it out. In other words, you haven't quite understand this, understood the scripture. Yes. Go spend some time in God's word mm -hmm. and try to get that understanding that can apply to your life and he said he also quoted a common proverb that the doctor goes to the sick mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so jesus is telling us make what did doctors do in the old days and still do in some parts of the world mm -hmm. house house calls. make house calls yeah. <laughs> they're not going to come to you perhaps those that are sick sure. in a sinful mm -hmm. way you need to go to them bring the medicine what's the medicine they need the gospel. The gospel. God loves you. You're a child of God. And you go with the medicine as a doctor making a house call. Go where they are and let them know I'm not ashamed to be seen with you. Marianella, you had a point yeah, to make. No, I just, I think that following Christ's example is most important because if he did that to come down, to leave all of heaven, he's the Lord of Lord, the king of the universe. And he came to be with us like the sinners. I mean, that's just really touching even for myself as as, he's the greatest you know, example of a humble he's missionary. He's the greatest spirit, example, and so then if I see someone else that's in need, you know, just remembering that Christ yeah. would still come for me, yeah. why Good. not reach out for that person? Good mm -hmm. thing yeah. for us to keep Amen. in mind and consider. Mm -hmm. So let's look at our next character here, the rich young ruler. We're going to look at this daytime interview with him, and we'll turn to Matthew 19 for that. Matthew chapter 19, the rich young ruler. And let's read the story, uh, verses 16 through 22. Do I have a volunteer to read? Tyler? Sure. Matthew 19, uh, verse 16 to 22, I will be reading from the New Living Translation. Someone came to Jesus with this, this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? 
Why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. But to answer your question, I, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones? The man asked. And Jesus replied, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all that you possess and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. All right. Thank you for reading, Tyler. Mark tells us that he not only came to Jesus, but that he came running and knelt down, knelt down before him. So this man was very earnest in his desire to know. That he had a burning desire to have a, an answer from Jesus. Good teacher, what thing, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? What do you see, what do you learn about this man already just from the way he asked his question? What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Tyler? Well, he's definitely works-based. What shall know, I do? What can he do I do to this, and heaven. then I have that. Right. If I do this, I have eternal life. Yes. Okay, so that already reveals something about where he's coming from mm -hmm. in his approach to salvation. Joy. I, I was about to say, he's almost asking, like, what is the key to the success story? Yeah. Right. What's the, what's the key? And when we do it ourselves, who gets the credit? We do. We get to heaven and we say, yes, I've been can. good enough, That's right? That's the whole point. That's right. it. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like we get to heaven and we say, I've done this. I've been good enough. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. We get to heaven and we say, thank God for Jesus, Amen. my Savior. Amen. None of us can get there on our own. Amen. Uh, Wilbur and then Derek. Yeah, well, I get, I mean, well, I understood from reading that he was sort of looking for a validation, saying, oh, these are the things that I did. Does that mean I'm qualified or I... Mm. You know, yeah, it could in. be. I, I read it and I thought, he's done all this stuff. He's been doing what he thinks he needs to do. And yet there's a burning desire in his heart. There's an emptiness. Something is lacking. What thing do I lack, he asks mm -hmm. later, right? Mm -hmm. So even though I've done everything right, I've been a good religious person, mm -hmm. I don't have this peace that I should have. I'm, I feel like something's lacking. Derek. I, I think you're right. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, Mark, Mark has him running and kneeling. But there's something like... He's basically, we could say, there's something missing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've done all of this. There's something missing. And uh, so I, I'm not sure that he's looking for validation as much as he's looking for what's missing. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, right. uh, you know, obviously he needs some help with his understanding of how we, in, we receive eternal life. Mm -hmm. It isn't by doing things. But, but again, a potential kingdom. Doesn't scripture say that Jesus looked at him and loved him? Mm -hmm. So, it's a potential king, citizen of the kingdom. Yes, mm -hmm. yes that's right. Mm -hmm. So, interestingly, Jesus doesn't say, well, you know, he doesn't get right to the point. He kind of works through this. He plays around a little bit with mm -hmm. uh, some gentle maneuvering. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in the wrong sense when I say he played around with it. But he, he took some time to take some steps to help this man come to his own realization. Have you ever noticed if you want to tell somebody, you want to communicate truth, and you just tell them this is what you need, especially with children, those of us who are parents, you know. Sometimes we need to allow our children to learn and discover through their own process, and then it really sinks in and it's meaningful. Well, Jesus, I think, is leading him on this kind of a course. Look at what he says to him. First, he, he tells him, you know, only God is good. And then he says, you know, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, well, should we, if we're breaking the commandments, are we kind of excluding ourselves from that relationship with God, which mm -hmm. is our key to salvation, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Knowing God, who, mm -hmm. whom to know is eternal life. Mm -hmm. So he, say, he mentions that, but look what he says. Mm -hmm. Which ones? <laughs> mm -hmm. I want to make sure I got it right. Which commandments? Because there's a lot. You know, there was, the, there was the commandments, the Ten Commandments, but then there were other things that were mentioned in the Pentateuch, and then the rabbis added on other things and expectations. Jesus quotes five commandments from the 
First or second table of the Ten Commandments? The second. 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 second table refers to which? Our relationship with God or the relationship with, with man? man. man. Yeah. Yeah. He quotes the ones relating to the relationship right. with man, mm -hmm. and then he, sums, he quotes the one that sums it all up, too. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. But he leaves one out. Which one did he leave out? Love God. God. No, I'm sorry, not the summing, but the, of the second six. On the second table, there are six commandments related to God. Coveting? coveting? He doesn't mention coveting. coveting. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. quotes numbers 6, 7, 8, and 9 in order. Mm -hmm. He doesn't quote 10, which, number 10, which is coveting. And then he, at the end, he tacks on what? Love number five, five, which was honoring your father, father and mother. mother. All right, let's ask ourselves a question. <laughs> Why did he go out of order with number five? He saved that for last, and then he didn't even mention covet. Jennifer. I think Jesus, you know, Jesus is having this conversation with this, um, with this ruler, but he already knew what the guy was going to say. So he was leading him down a path of thought so he could get to sort of a final persuasive statement, which was, you know, I know you're going to say, I've been doing this, I've been doing this, I've been doing this, but Jesus was like, you're coming to me not to talk about what you've already been doing, mm, but you're coming yeah. to me because something is missing. Mm. And the thing that was missing, I think, was a relationship with God. You know, okay. he had checked the box, yep. but Jesus wanted him to have a relationship and be his disciple. Right. But before we move on to that missing thing, I wanted, uh, you're right, that the reason why he might have done this method of quoting the scripture and the order he did it, those commandments that he quoted, can you, t are they humanly testable? Can you look at a person and see, are you murdering, are you stealing, yes. are you lying? Mm. They are, yes. right? Yes. Mm. Is coveting? No. No, no. you yeah. can't see what yeah. someone's yeah. thinking or doing, you know, desiring in their heart. That's covetousness. Mm. But why would he save the one about honoring father and mother for last? Um, oh, Rick, I, I, I know you had a point. Tyler will come back. Uh, I think um, Matthew, uh, Jesus had a dispute with some of the religious leaders concerning uh, their... Uh, abrasion of the, the that commandment in that some of them were uh, using the tradition okay. to circumvent that commandment to honor their father and their mother. They would give things to the temple, money and resources to the temple, and and, and they thought that if I Poor give it to, right, if I give it to the temple, then. I would not be guilty of dishonoring my mother or my father. So Jesus knew that. So practice. the establishment had okayed it for somebody to say, whatever I dedicate to the temple, Korban, mm -hmm. releases me from my obligation to care for my parents. Right. And maybe Jesus put that one on the end because this guy might have been guilty of that. Exactly. Tyler. Well, I would um, venture to say that Jesus saved the best for last year, and this is why I would say that. He says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Okay. I think he is addressing covetousness there. What? Yeah, you're statement. getting ahead of us. That's where mm -hmm. we're going. You're right. But look at what happens when he says this. It could be then that the covetousness was a problem. He didn't mention that. And you can't uh, prove that he was or wasn't. And he says, well, I've done all these things, right? right. Yeah. Derek? I don't think that's the best. I think Jennifer's come right. Follow me. The best is come follow me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. In, in other words, all of these things are not unimportant. Right. But they are not the way of salvation. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, the keeping of the commandments, whether we're relating to God or relating to our fellow man, is, is only an indication mm -hmm. of a life-changing relationship with mm -hmm. God through mm -hmm. Jesus. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, th I, I, I think I like your point. If you'd been too abrupt, maybe the rich young ruler couldn't have handled it. But, uh, but he's clearly coming down to you need to follow me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's where we're going because that's yes. where Jesus took him. He <laughs> says, if you want to be perfect, so you're lacking some. Perfect could be translated mature. Mm -hmm. If you want to fill that void, that's something that's lacking, what does he tell him to do? Follow go me. Everything. First, sell everything. go and everything. sell everything yeah. he had. Now, this guy could have been, through his wealth, he could have been using his wealth and his possessions yeah. to actually feel kind of powerful and in control and proud. Mm -hmm. Because he would be, you can assume that because he's a religious person, he is giving to the poor. Giving mm -hmm. alms was right. an important part right. of the sure. Jewish faith. Yeah. Mm. And as a matter of fact, the rabbis had established a certain limit to what you should give. Mm. Did you know that? No. 20%. Don't give more than 20% of your earnings or your possession to the poor because you should maintain your wealth so that you can continue giving and being a blessing to society. Mm. So what does that allow you to do? That allows you to become proud. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at me. Look how I'm using my gifts and my abilities. So this guy has a heart problem of pride and also I'm in control. 
Look at the power I have because of my wealth. And, and Jesus is getting to that where he's saying, go give all that up. Because you've, you're doing it that way. And it's not working for you, right? right? You're feeling like something's lacking. lacking. And yet, there's more. Give it all up. Come follow me. And by the way, I know we, I, there's other hands. We want to look at our fourth character yet, too. So we're going to move on quickly. But it's interesting to note that he says, you'll have kingdom in heaven and so forth. And when this follow, the following to this, just read. If somebody would um, read verses 23 and 24 for me in Matthew chapter 19. Willie, you Anytime. ready to read that? Verses 23 and 24. I'll be reading from the uh, New King James Version. Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 to 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. He says this because the rich young ru ruler went away sad when Jesus told me he went away sad. And the disciples were amazed. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> Uh, now, there have been people who've said, well, that camel going through the eye of the needle refers to a gate in, called Camel's Gate in Jerusalem, and the camel had to be unpacked of all its possessions and get down on its knees and go through, and that shows how we have to let go of our stuff and be humble. It's a very nice idea, but that gate wasn't called the Camel's Gate till centuries after Jesus' time. Jesus, Jesus was using hyperbole, this idea that, let me really make the point by expressing it in a hyperbolic expression, you know, exaggerated teaching. A camel was the largest land animal that was known mm -hmm. to the people in, in Palestine. And the needle is the smallest uh, aperture in a household, the eye of the needle. And so he's saying, if you could take the largest animal you know and put it through the smallest little space that you know, that's what it's like. And the disciples respond by saying, what? Who Verse 25, who can be saved then? Be saved? Because they attributed wealth with divine favor. Right. Mm. Wealth is like... You know, if you're wealthy, it's because God loves you. That's right. And they could have mm -hmm. Old Testament uh, basis in understanding that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, who could be saved? And Jesus says, with man, with man it's impossible. impossible. But, but with God, God, all things, all things are, are possible. possible. And interestingly, after that, Peter, you know, he's always the red, who's ready to speak up. Peter says what in verse 27? Can I read it to you? Mm -hmm. Then Peter answered. This is from the New King James Version. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Jesus says the rich young ruler should leave everything to follow him. And Peter says, well, we did that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we must be getting a big reward for that. <laughs> mm. And then Jesus goes into the teaching of the first that shall be last and so forth. We don't have time to go all into that. But they did leave everything. Mm -hmm. Fishing wasn't the lowest occupation, by the way. Mm. Fishermen did pretty well. And Matthew a tax collector it. like Matthew was leaving a real sure. lucrative uh, uh, job to mm. follow Jesus. Mm. Nathan, before Derek. we go to that last story, I, I think it's so important to realize that Jesus did not ask Nicodemus to give up everything because that wasn't getting in the way of his relationship. That wasn't his problem. He, he didn't ask Matthew to give up everything, right. but he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the problem was not the money but that it was getting in the, in the way, way of the relationship That's with right. God. That's right. Uh, he trusted in his wealth and his religious works. And yep. Jesus said, I know that's going to keep you out of the kingdom if, yep. you, if that's where your trust is. That's right. Your confidence needs to be in the relationship with me. And so that's why you're right. That's why he asked him, because that was his need. Uh, let's take a look then at the next story, the rich young ruler. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 19. The rich fool. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep, the rich fool. In Luke 12? In Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. Luke 12, 16 through 29. And 16 do I have to some? 21. Would someone read that for us? Did I say 29? I'm looking yeah. at the 21 and saying 29. Joy? Reading from the King James Version. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, 
This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So, he, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Mm. Thank you. Mm. So this man said, I've hit the jackpot. I just hit, you know, I, I just hit it big. I can take life easy. Eat, drink, and be, be merry was a common expression of the day. We might say, you got it made in the shade or you're living on easy street or, uh, you know, whatever the <laughs> expression is where you live. But he says, I've got it made. I can eat, drink, and be merry. It was kind of this Epicurean Greek thought that mm -hmm. actually entered into the Jewish lifestyle as well, this belief that when God's blessed me, I've got it made for the rest of my life. And he was trusting in what? His, 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 his riches. His possessions, his, his riches. Possessions. Is that a good, safe place for us to put our trust? No. Well, no. the parable t teaches us that no. As a matter of fact, it's a strong word Jesus uses. In the parable, he's called a fool. That indicates not just somebody who likes stupidity, but someone who's morally and spiritually depraved, mm -hmm. deficient in some way. Mm -hmm. And it's the same uh, in the, when the Greek New Old Testament was translated, it's the same word that was used in the Psalms where it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Is no this God. is the word that's used to, to refer to this fool who thinks, well, I don't need, that's what he's saying in essence, there's no God, I don't need to take care of that. I'm just moving on I with see my something life. here, uh, Nathan. Uh, you look at these stories, you see that Jesus is meeting these individuals Real where short. they're at. And... Uh, when we're discipling uh, the rich and the famous, uh, one thing we must have is tact and not to attack riches because there's no scripture in the Bible that says that God attacks wealth. But um, he puts it in a context to help them to understand that status okay. and wealth yeah. is, is not the end all be all, but God bless you with it so you can bless others. Wealth is not evil. It's not bad to have wealth. It's the way we relate to our That's stuff. Right. Does our stuff yeah. own us or do we possess it? And God wants us to be able to share with people who might be rich and increased with goods that there's something greater. There's treasure in heaven That's through right. a relationship with Jesus. That's right. So God could open those doors with people who are rich and famous and we might never expect to interact with. We can pray for them and reach them for Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Nathan. Amen. What a great study. And thanks for joining us for the study today. And, you know, I think of people like Barnabas who gave their land away. God blessed you with wealth so that you can bless others and lay up treasure in heaven. Mm -hmm. And I just want to pray that we'll learn some valuable lessons mm -hmm. to reach out to people of wealth and influence and also be good stewards of the blessings we've received. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this challenging study today. Help us to see every person as a potential candidate for the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. and help us to use the resources and the influence you've given to us to bless others in jesus name amen. 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 amen well thanks for joining us for hope sabbath school today we'd love to hear from you take the lessons that you've learned you might be saying well, i have a lot of wealth i have a lot of fame how can you use that to bless the lives of those around you, to draw them to the kingdom. Or I know someone of influence. Reach out to them. Don't hold this precious truth to yourself. Take what you've learned and share it with those around you. 